We're going to be going Zechariah 3 tonight. Zechariah 3. As my wife keeps reminding me, it's not Zechariah, it's Zechariah. Zechariah. Um, all right. I'm going to read through. And then we'll pray and then we'll just get started. Hello, sir. Hey, sir. Zechariah 3. Yes, sir. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, I see I have removed your iniquity from you. I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head. And they put clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by then the angel of the Lord honest Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house, and likewise have charge of my courts, and I will give you places to walk among these who stand here. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine, and under his fig tree. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you God, for your word. Uh, I thank you, Lord, for the, the rich depth of it. Let's pray, God, for this time, Lord, as we dig in, Lord, that you would, you would be glorified, that you would speak through me, help me, Lord, to get out of your way. And, Thing I have planned to say that's not, not of you or uh, just drop to the ground. Lord, we just pray, God, that you bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All righty, so here we are uh, in the midst of a vision already going on, a vision that took place. Just a thought. I'm not quite sure. Um, 
And then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. Um, the angel of the Lord is a, is a phrase that is generally associated with Christophanes and, and the idea of uh, Jesus pre-incarnation, pre-birth into uh, humanity. Um, you'll see in several places in Scripture this, uh, the angel of the Lord. Um, there are other, other angels, but it's the, in Hebrew and in Greek, the is, a, is a definitely a specific thing. And Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And it's an interesting, we don't get a view here of what, other than we, we go down to, to the other verses and we can kind of get a picture of what, how is he opposing him. And as, as we know, he's the accuser of the brothers. So you have this picture of, here's Jesus, the angel of the Lord, standing here with Joshua. Yeah, right here at his right hand is Satan. And I kind of get that picture if, if you've seen the Lord of the Rings, that guy's beside the king speaking dirty in his ear, you know, nasty things in his ear. I don't remember the character's names, but he's his, his name is Wormtongue in the, in the movie. Something, something Wormtongue. I don't know the character's name, but the point is, is he's constantly bending his mind and twisting, twisting. What's going on? And so you kind of get that picture of Satan just standing there talking to the angel of the Lord about uh, Joshua. And he's saying, Gosh, this is the one you picked? He's so dirty. He's got this sin. He's got this sin. He's got this problem. He's pride, pride, prideful. And he's this, 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 that. And he's just, you get that feel that this is what he's doing. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuked you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Who can the Lord... <laughs> there is no authority with the Lord. He's in His own name. I rebuke you. This, this could also be a picture of the angel of the Lord using the authority of the Father to rebuke Him, but it's the Lord says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. And this kind of gives us a reminder of uh, what happens um, in Jude, recorded in Jude 1 9, the archangel struggling over the body of uh, Moses. And yet the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked you. And I think it's a it's a good reminder for us uh, that we don't have to pretend we're some spiritual powerhouse, you know, whacking at Satan, whacking at his demons. That's just take it to the Lord. Just the Lord rebuke you. I don't, I'm not some amazing spiritual warrior that, that you know has to handle Satan. The Lord can handle Satan. He's, he's got it under control. So take take that to him early and often. And so he's so Jesus is standing here with, with Joshua here, the enemy here, and the enemy's like, this guy is so dirty. Don't you see him? And Jesus' response is, he's a brand. They pull out of the fire. Don't you think I know he's dirty? You think of a fire, think of this burning pit of, and you pull out one piece of wood, that wood is going to be dirty. It's going to have ash. It's going to be burnt. It's going to be pretty much useless for anything. Particularly, we take it out of fire, now it just sits there. It doesn't burn because it will stop burning in a little while, right? So it's, you know, he, Jesus is, is acknowledging that Joshua, yeah, he's not much. He's not that big of a deal. I didn't, I didn't pick him because he was awesome. I didn't pick him because of all oh, that's the one. I'm tapping. I'm tapping his talents. He picked him because he chose. Just like he just like he chose in Jerusalem. He 
chose Joshua. And that's what made him, made him great. He chose Joshua. He chose him to clean him. He chose him to use him as high priest at this time. And he's going to do the work necessary to prepare him for that. Story of John Wesley. When he was only six, year old, six years old, he was trapped in a burning house and was only rescued when one neighbor climbed on the other's shoulders and pulled him out of the window. A picture of the scene was drawn for Wesley and he kept that drawing until he died and wrote under, under it, Zechariah 3.2, Is this not a brand plucked from the burning? And I think it's, it's a good, useful... This is John Wesley. We still have... <laughs> Wesleyan churches and Methodist churches and you know, I know two, bro two brothers there but it's a uh, and yet he was he kept this as an often reminder of this he was just a wasn't something amazing I just plucked him out to use him and the same goes for us God, God will pluck us out of the fire pluck us out of the burning to be used for him Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Filthy garments giving a picture of the dirtiness of his sin. And yet he was standing in the presence of Jesus. What better place to be with your sin is standing in the presence of Jesus, the one who can clean it. And then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he said, and to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you. I will clothe you with rich robes. He spoke to assuming ministering angels here. They took away his filthy garments. Jesus cleansed his iniquity. And then they clothed him with rich robes. And it's a it's again a, a good view of the Father's heart for us here in that He doesn't just take away the iniquity. He doesn't just clothe us. He clothed them in rich robes. This is a, an honor thing. He, he, he took a, a dirty thing and made him honorable, made him righteous, made him useful, gave him a place. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. So Zechariah gets in on this. It's his vision. But he's, so he, remember Joshua's not necessarily here. This is a vision of Zechariah of what's going on. And Zechariah responds in this vision. And he says, you know, this, this, the person, we, we have this image of the person of Zechariah being cleaned by the removal of the dirty robes. But the turban was a, a, was a symbol of his station as the high priest. As it, was, it was as a priest. It was a priestly, a part of the priestly garment. So this is his, who he represents to the people, his, his turban. So, Zechariah, here we have as a prophet who has a heart for the, the spiritual health of the people. He, he's, he comes on behalf of the people to the Lord in this vision. Lord, can you give him a clean turban too? Can, can you fix his ministry? His bro that's broken and dirty too. Can you give him a clean ministry again? I uh, think that's for me that's a that's an encouragement the Lord not only desires to fix you but, but desires to fix your relationship with those who you're supposed to serve your your children your you know if you're a pastor if you're an elder deacon whatever those who you're supposed to serve the Lord desires to fix that to fix you 
our representation of him that we may have sullied. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joseph, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house. And we might expect this of a high priest, but as believers, it's, we get the same honor. In Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We as prophet, priests, and kings can take advantage of this, right? We can, we can approach Jesus. But understand this section also starts with if. If he will walk in my way. If he will keep my command. We're saved as followers of Christ without, without a doubt. But if we don't walk in his ways and if we don't keep his commands, we should not expect a lot of access to the throne. We should not expect that our prayers are going to be answered and the Lord's, you know, not, not that our prayers of repentance, He's there to hear, but if we're walking in iniquity, as believers, we may, our, our prayers may be truly hitting the ceiling as they feel sometimes. <laughs> Verse 8. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I'm bringing forth my servant, the branch. Okay, and here we have um, a messianic pointer here. The, the, the concept of a branch is used several times in Scripture. And, Isaiah and Jeremiah is pointing forward to the uh, to his servant, the Messiah, and that will come into this world and um, fulfill uh, the many prophecies about him. And for behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, that we have here. Possibly, probably, I think, another word picture that's often used for Messiah, the Messiah, the stone. Stone that the builder rejected, the cornerstone, chief cornerstone. On it we have seven eyes, is a kind of a seven is what the per perfection eyes or un understanding or knowledge or wisdom or the things that and this, you know, will have perfect knowledge, will have perfect vision, will have perfect understanding. Behold, I will engrave its inscription. Looked at a couple uh, um, commentaries to try to get an idea of what, what, where that, you know, what that's about. I think I didn't find any that I that seemed to make any sense to me. But I just, what is the Lord? This is something else that the Lord engraves, right? Ten Commandments. You know, that's one thing we know who engraves. Um, which is his word. Jesus is, is the word, right? So I'm wondering if that's, that's another point to um, you know, Jesus being the word of God, the Messiah being the word of God. And I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. The sins of the whole world, as we know, were removed. One day, or just just like when we sinned and death entered the world, Adam and Eve began dying. Sin is done to tell us that it was taken care of at the cross. But human history is still working itself to that point where the world will no longer be here. God's God's eternal vision of points in time when things are. Things happen are not necessarily the same as ours in time. There is no no more work 
that Jesus has to do regarding sin. It was done that day for Jerusalem, for Israel, for the whole world. The work was done. And now we're working out human history and, and the rest of the prophetic uh, landscape that God has laid out for us. Verse 10. And in that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. And this is kind of a colloquial saying of, you know, that there'll be peace and prosperity. And, you know, we're going to hang out, we're going to snap some grapes off the vine and we'll eat some figs and we'll just relax together because there'll be plenty of food and we're not going to have to be at war. And this is, again, there will be that. There will be that day. There will be no more war. There will be no more sin. King Jesus will be literally on the throne. Peace will be here. Um, I think it's a... Uh, the Lord is trying to encourage Zechariah here. I think he was trying to encourage him by taking his eyes to the Messiah. <coughs> I know it's a mess there. What's going on? But there's a Messiah coming. There's a Messiah coming. There's, here's, my, here's my plan to redeem the world from sin. The same thing that, that you know for us is that our eyes need to continually be brought back to the Messiah. And that's, I think it's um, it's very easy for me personally to be distracted. It's very easy to become, when you're distracted, to become dirty. You know, you're, if your eyes are not focused on Jesus, Oh, and now I'm over here doing this thing that may not necessarily be bad, but now I'm still not looking at Jesus, and so I take a step further, and now I'm in this thing that... Hmm. And so it's, it becomes a... If our eyes are not consistently on Jesus, we can easily become distracted and dirty. But if we repent, He is faithful. We can, we can approach the throne room boldly, and the Father is faithful just to forgive us to put our focus back on his son. Um, this is kind of a short, short chapter, that's about all I have.